praise the Lord from Pastor Strader at Lighthouse Church. Thanks for connecting with us through our podcast. Our prayer is that it's a blessing to you as we try to reach, equip, and mobilize Jesus' name disciples in Apache Junction, Arizona, and the surrounding region. Enjoy today's podcast and come back often. God bless you. We love you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ya la I believe, now this is something we could say every service, but I believe it specifically for this service, that God desires to fill someone with the gift of the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking with other tongues, as the Spirit of the Lord gives them the ability. Hallelujah. And with that, a refilling of those who have the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Anybody want a refilling of the Holy Ghost? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, put some fuel on that flame tonight. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God, my God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, have your way. Have your way, God. Have your way, God. Praise God, praise God. Amen and amen. If you have your Bibles, we'll turn to me with me to the book of Acts, chapter 2. Thankful and so very humbled tonight. Have been for several couple of months because knowing of the reports that have been coming in from churches and pastors and young people, young adults. If you have that slide, Sister Angela, you could pop it up there, move the mission. But as you know, there is an unprecedented spirit of sacrificial giving that has hit not just the youth department, but it has hit every department and every ministry. It has hit churches, and I'm thankful to God that this year can combine together as churches that we have given a total of $288,000 to move the mission. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And uh, what we don't understand, or what I, I don't understand, I'll just put it that way, is really the, 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 the magnitude of what this represents this may represent just dollars and cents to some, but what I see it, it representing is God saying, if you think I can do this with what you can see, what do you think I can do for what you can't see? If you think I can bless you with something that's going to burn one day, what do you think of what I can do with something that's going to live eternally? Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. There were four churches that gave over $50,000, and this church is one of them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we give God praise for that right now? Hallelujah, Jesus. We praise you. We glorify you. We honor you. We magnify you. God, we take a step of faith forward, knowing that you, oh God, are guiding our steps. Hallelujah. Oh, let's lift our voice as a trumpet right now. 
I believe we're worshiping for what is about to happen, what's going to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. We magnify you. We glorify you. God, you are worthy to be praised. Amen and amen and amen. Well, you may be seated. Tonight, before I get started, I'd like maybe to have just a couple of testimonies. Amen. Brother Phelps, I think it'd be in good order. Yes. Let's praise him. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Acts 2 and verse 38. Amen. Tonight, uh, it will be a little different. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead and stand. Sorry. I apologize. Yeah, you, we can stand because... I don't believe it will be this way, but in many places you do something like I'm about to do tonight, there'd probably be very few amens, very few shouts, definitely nobody running the aisle. But tonight, um, it's going to be different, but I feel that someone needs to just listen and hear what the Word says. Right. Acts 2 and verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and unto and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. If you would turn back with me. What, what was something, what was the initiation? What was some of the starting points of what we just read in Acts chapter 1 and uh, verse 15. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David 
spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Chapter, chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house like it is filled here tonight where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. When we say fuel the fire, that's what we're talking about. And it said upon each of them, and they were all filled. Everybody say they were all filled. They were all filled. With the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak. Say they began to speak. Began. With other tongues. As the Spirit gave them the utterance or the ability. Amen. And then we get to, well, how do I partake in this experience and we get to Acts 2 and verse 38 to repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, and then to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I want to simply teach about what Jesus says about salvation. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Sin is, it is critical to uh, realize that everyone is in the same position. Some say, why, why are we talking about this tonight? I believe it's because we need to understand, we need to get on a, the same field, the same ground, if you will. Because I believe there are some here who you don't shout, you, you're, you're, you're not uh, comfortable, you're not familiar with what you see here done. Or what you feel. And you have questions. And that is a good thing, to have questions. It is a good thing to have questions. And uh, if you have not been filled with the Holy Ghost, if you have not been in services that are uh, filled with the Holy Ghost, surely it's quite different. I, I remember going to, and I'm just using this experience because it was mine. could have been a different church, different denomination, but I went to a Catholic church. And, uh, and uh, being raised in an apostolic Pentecostal oneness church, I sat there in amazement of the lack of power I felt. I saw a lot of tradition. I saw a lot of repetition, but I saw no power. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And so it's critical that we realize that everyone is in the same position. The person next to you is in the same position or was in the same position as you are. There is none greater in this place than the other. We are all sinners saved by grace, there, including, including even the greatest among all. In fact, Paul said, I am the least, of, at the very end, he said, I am the chiefest among sinners. At the end of his life, he realized that I am the least of all of these. And so we are all guilty of working against God, and we are all uh, in a place at one point where we were headed toward hell apart from God's grace. For Romans 3 and 23 said it like this, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The reality, the fact is, is that no one is perfect. Everyone has sinned. And thus, everyone needs salvation. Everyone needs a God. Everyone needs to partake in what we have and what we experience and what you feel in this place tonight. Because everyone has sinned. Man, in John 5, 14, Jesus said, stop sinning or something worse is going to come. So here God is telling us, stop sinning. You need to, you need to stop doing what you're doing because something worse is going to come. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are clear in Scripture. When we begin to partake in things of sexual immorality, uh, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these, anyone living in that sort of lifestyle will not inherit the kingdom of God. Any type of sin in your life left unchecked will keep you from heaven. It will keep you from heaven. And friend, it is not worth eternity. There is nothing that you are doing that is sinful that is worth losing your soul over. You must 
be saved. You must come out from among the world and be separate from the world. You must not act like the world, talk like the world, think like the world. Any type of sin in your life can keep you from heaven. And so we need to talk about this. And in John 8 and 11, it says, Go, he told the lady, go and sin no more. He said, I don't condemn you, but I am telling you to go and not to sin any longer. And here's the reality is that if you are in a sinful state tonight and you don't know what you are doing, that's okay. But after you've heard this word of God, there is a level of responsibility that is now imparted into your spirit that says, what will I do with what I just heard? What will I do with the idea and the fact that I have sin in my heart? Because every one of us have sin in our heart. This is, <laughs> I'm not just talking to one or two or three. I'm talking to everybody, starting with me first. Amen. Go and sin no more. Hell is an eternal destination of torment, but God desires to save us from hell. How? How does he save us from hell? Well, I'm, gonna, I've got to, I'm just summarizing. This is just going to be a quick 30-minute Bible study, hopefully. How is he going to save us from torment, to save us from hell? It is through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on Calvary. Why did he go to the cross of Calvary? He died on the cross of Calvary because he saw and he knew that someone was going to have to pay the price for your and I's sin. And he said, I am going to take that price and I will shed my life, I will shed my, my skin, I'll shed my blood on the cross of Calvary so, so that those that can want to go to heaven to be with me, they can have and partake in salvation. Yeah. I'm willing to give it all so that they can have eternity. And so his purpose was to save the lost. In Matthew 18 and 11, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. That is exactly why he came to this earth. Yes, he did a lot of great miracles. He did a lot of great phenomenons. He did a lot of great things that we preach about. But friend, don't get it wrong. He came with one, of my, one objective and one objective only. And that was to seek and to save that which was lost. I've got one job. That's why when that job's done, I'm getting out of here. Because when that job's done now, that has been that the responsibility has been imparted from me to them. Amen. Amen. Who are saved? That's a good question. Who, who's going to be saved? Matthew 24 and 13 gives us a very direct answer. But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. What are we trying to endure? We're enduring sin. We're enduring temptation. We're enduring uh, sometimes persecution. We're enduring sometimes opposition. But those that endure into the end shall be saved. Well, goodness, if I, if now I realize that I've got sin in my heart and I, I don't want to go to hell and, and I know that God died for me so that I could receive salvation. I can receive something that God would, that it would, keep, would rescue me out of hell and, and I know that I've got to endure into the end. So what, what now do I have to do to obtain some of these things? What, what's the next step? Well, the next step is faith. Faith is the first step in our walk with God. It is a firm belief or persuasion, a found for receiving what God has planned for us. John 8 and 24, Jesus said, If you believe not that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. We've got to have faith in God. We've got to know that He is and that He is a, a rewarder of them that... Dil- you're going to have to, those, you know, a lot of you know all the scriptures. You can help me preach tonight. Amen. We've got to know that if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in, what is it talking about? The Savior of the world. I, I believe that Jesus Christ was the Savior of the world. Amen. I believe there's one God, and his name is Jesus. There is no other God. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. There is only one God. And even if there was another God, a second God, or a third God, I'd want to be baptized and I would want to receive the spirit of the one that died for me. So friend, that that just does away with anything. We've got scripture after scripture after scripture to back one God, but any argument, I'm I'm going to serve the one that came and died for me. And his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. 
Hebrews eleven six. 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We must have faith. We must believe that Jesus is that Savior, that Jesus is the one that died on that cross for our sins. Ephesians 2 and 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. And not that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Salvation will not be obtained without faith. I said it cannot be obtained without faith. But faith alone will not complete the process of salvation. We can say we believe, and now we are a believer. I'm a believer. I'm a believer on Jesus Christ. I believe that he is. I believe that he died. I believe he has all power. I believe he can do anything. Praise God. That's a great first step. The challenge is this is where a lot of denominations, they'll stop. And I pray that they receive the revelation of the majority of the New Testament. Because it does not stop there. Only faith is the only thing that initiates the process. Now that we have faith, what do we do? We now have to have obedience in the one that we believe in. I believe God is. I believe he's the creator of the world. Well, that now initiates something in your spirit that says, oh, I've got to obey what he says. All right? While faith is powerful and necessary, it is powerless without obedience. Powerless without obedience. If we believe in Jesus, we will obey his word, and then we will experience victory over sin. Just having faith in God doesn't give you victory over sin. The devils believe. Satan believes. He knows there's a God. He served him in heaven. Lucifer was cast out. He was a second in command. He was cast out of heaven. He believes. And they tremble. But they don't have victory over sin. John 14 and 15, Jesus said, If you love me, if you love the one that you have faith in, you will keep my commandments. I love that you believe in me. I love that you have faith in me. But now I'm asking you to obey me. I'm asking you to keep my commandments. How do we know that we love God? We keep his commandments. We obey him. Amen? If love is obedience. 1 John 2 and 3. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Amen. That's what a lot of people need to do. They need to begin. I'm not suggesting we be fruit inspectors because it's the fruit of the Spirit, but we do need to have a spirit of discernment that says, man, that is a man of God. That is a woman of God. That is a church with the power of the Holy Ghost. And friend, it doesn't mean it has to be the largest church either. Just because it's a big church that has a lot of great programs and plans and music and musicians and, and all these things, they, they have 20 people and full-time staff, and that's great. But just because of their size doesn't mean they have full truth. In fact, the Word of God says quite the contrary. He says, narrow is the path that leadeth to heaven. Narrow. But wide is that path that leadeth to hell. And he also it says, hell hath enlarged itself. So we've got to evaluate that um, who's keeping the commandments? Who's keeping the commandments? Obedience or disobedience to God reveals our relationship with God. If I have a relationship with God, I'm going to obey what he says. If I have a relationship with him, if I talk with him, he talks with me, I commune with him, he communes with me, then I'm going to listen to what he has to say. Well, how do I know what he's saying? Well, one, in prayer. Two, through the word of God. And three, through the man of God. Whenever you sit down and listen to, Brother Campitella told me this just the other day, and it was profound to my small pea-sized brain. But he said, when you, when you ask a minister to come and you sit down at that chair and you listen to a message, you are inquiring of the prophet. You are inquiring of the prophet. You're saying, what does the word, what, what does God have to say? What does God say? And it's the prophet, it's the preacher's responsibility to inquire of the Lord. Lord, what do you want the people to hear? What do you want to say? Well, how do you want to minister? God, get me out of the way. Just use me as a vessel. 
Just use me as a vessel. And so uh, we, it reveals our relationship with God. We must determine to be faithful. It's a decision. Amen. It's a decision. I believe, but now what must I do to be saved? I believe that he is. I know I have faith, and, and now I want to obey him. What, mu what must I do to be saved? Now we're getting into the good stuff. Oh, man, this is where it gets nice and juicy and all powerful and, man, awesome. So when we begin asking these questions, what must I do to be saved? Isn't that the question of the world? That's the question we should ask. God, what is it going to take to make it to heaven? That's the question I want to know. That's the answer I want to have. The, the question I want answered. What is it going to take to be saved? And we read, uh, we began to read it in Acts 2 and 37. Now when they heard this, they heard preaching like what you're hearing today. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What are we going to do with what we just heard? And Peter said unto them, Simply, you must repent. You must ask God to forgive you of all of your sins. Now, when you come to this altar tonight, you don't come up here begging God to forgive you, but you come to God asking, Lord, cleanse me of my sins, purify my mind, forgive me all the things I did, thought I was going to do, wanted to do. Purify me, cleanse me, wash me. When we repent of our sins and then we are baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and then... After you've repented, first we've, we've already believed on God. Now we've repented, and now we're getting baptized in Jesus' name. Now, we're going to talk about baptism more in just a moment. And then you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Luke 13, 3, and Jesus said, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. We must repent. Feel, con uh, feel conviction. Feeling conviction of sin is a good thing. If you're here tonight or if you've ever been here in a service, if you've ever been in any service and you feel conviction on your heart, man, maybe I should change what I do. That's a good thing. That's the Holy, actually what really, you want to know, that's the Holy Ghost. That feeling of, man, I need to make a shift. I need to make a change. I need, there, there's something, that's the Holy Ghost. You, you, you've got it all over and you just don't even know it yet. Amen. That's conviction. This is God leading you to repentance. 2 Corinthians 7.10 For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. That's what repentance is. Godly sorrow. And it worketh repentance to salvation. Amen. I'm not begging God, but I'm, I'm sorry for what I have done. Proverbs 28 and 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. God says, hey, just put them all out there. I know them already anyway. I know you. I knew you from the very beginning. I knew you before you even were. In fact, I count the hairs on your head. I know exactly. And, so, and for some, he doesn't have to count very much. But he, 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 counts, he counts all. And I'm headed that way, so don't worry. But he counts the hairs on your head. And all you people that are younger than me or even old, definitely older than me that have more hair than I do and it's not thinning, uh, I rebuke you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but he counts the hairs on your head. That's how much he knows you. And if he can count the hair, don't you think he knows your sin? Sure, he knows our sin. Sure, he knows our shortcomings. Sure, he knows our failures and our faults. He knows all those things. We're all in the same boat together. Amen. But he that covers his sins shall not prosper. But if you will come to an altar of prayer and you'll confess your sins and you'll then forsake them. Oh, that's the key word. We've got to make up in our mind, I'm turning away from what I've been doing. I'm going to stop sinning. Then I will have mercy of God. The next step, after we have repentance, we are baptized in the name of Jesus. This is not an option. This is a requirement of salvation. It's not something you do if it feels good or just as a representation. No, it is essential to salvation to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. It is essential. It's essential. Amen. And we're going to talk about and we're going to prove that in Scripture. What does that word baptized mean? Does it mean to take water and to sprinkle it on the forehead? Does it mean just to take a, a, a bath or a shower? No, it means to be submerged in water. Submersion, uh, baptism by submerging, meaning your whole body goes down into the water. And when you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the Word of the Lord says that is a washing away of all of your sins. It is a wash. It's like... 
There, it's like, I love Brother Akers used to use this, and I love it, and I'll use it till the day I die. He said, it's like a, a, a backboard. You had all your sins on it, and, and man, this is all kinds of bad things, and everybody could see, and everybody knew, except you know, all the enemy knew that the smell of sin was all over you in the spiritual sense. But then when you're baptized in Jesus, I don't know what I said, but somebody, but when you're baptized in Jesus' name, all of those sins are washed away. I said all of those sins are washed away. All of those sins are washed away. Being baptized is one of the greatest things outside of receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost you could ever do. John 3 and 3. Why, why, okay, how is it essential? Why, what, are you, what are you talking about? Not every church talks about that or preaches that. It's a little different. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, I know I've got to be born again. How am I born again? Water baptism and then the infilling of the Holy Ghost. We're going to talk about it. John 3, 5, two verses later, except a man be born of water. There it is. There's the requirement. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That is the requirement for baptism, that you must be baptized in Jesus' name in the water. You must go down and be baptized. To enter into the kingdom of heaven. Mark 16 and 16. He that believes. Oh, I'm, I'm a believer. Thank God you're a believer. But it's not just belief alone. And is. Shall be what? If you believe. And you're baptized. He shall be saved. Jesus said that baptism is a part of being born again and saved. Peter also clarifies that water baptism is part of that salvation process. There's other scriptures that I'm not reading, but they're all in there. There's plenty of them. But I'm just doing a 30-minute deal tonight. The Bible shows only one way to be baptized. This is important. There's only one way to be baptized. If I'm going to go in water, what am I applying to my life? What am I applying to my life? The saving power is in calling on the name of Jesus. You see, we, we, we've got a baptismal back there, and it's filled with water. Uh, but we some, some have been baptized in lakes. Some have been baptized in pools. Some have filled, some of the people have really big tubs at home, and maybe you can get them all underwater that way. I don't know. But really, where you get baptized has really no significance. It's the name that is applied. It's the name that is applied. Now, Father is no name. Son is no name. And Holy Ghost is no name. It says baptize them in the Father, the Son of the Holy Ghost. What is the name of the Father? Jesus. What's the name of the Son? Jesus. What's the name of the Holy Ghost? Jesus. There's only one name. One name. One name. Who's the one that died for you? Jesus. If I'm going to be baptized and get any name applied to my life, it's going to be the one that died for me. Jesus' name. Amen. So, the saving power is calling on the name of Jesus. Is this all right? Yeah. All right. Ephesians 4 and 5. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. What, what's the significance of that? That means there's not two ways to be baptized. There's a lot of people, and I, I could preach right here, but I'm going to restrain. But there's a lot of people, a lot of denominations, they're adding on to the method of being baptized to satisfy a carnal spirit. The spirit of Satan himself that says, oh, you can say it, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. As long as the word name Jesus is in there, you're okay. I disagree with that. And, and we can go in all scripture. When everybody was baptized in this Bible, they were all baptized in Jesus' name. I, t I always tell someone this when I'm talking about this, and they begin to talk to me. Well, what about this? And what about this church? And what about this? What about this? You show me one example where they baptized, in the, in the Bible, where they baptized in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, then I'll believe you. Uh -huh. But until then, I can show you several examples where they baptized the, the apostles, the first church, right after Jesus ascended into heaven. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to endure you with the power of the Holy Ghost. And, and this is when the birth of the church happened. We read it. The, 120 were up there. He said, I'm going to give you. There's going to be power. You're going to be endued with power. That power is the Holy Ghost. And what did they do? They baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other. 
For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no other name. And there's, no, no, there's salvation and no other name. Acts twenty two sixteen. And now why tarriest thou? This is important. Because some people say, well, I'll wait 10 years or when I'm comfortable. No. Why are you tarrying? Why won't you get baptized now? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What's the name of the Lord? The name of the Lord is Jesus. The power of baptism is in our faith in his name. The original church always baptized with water in immersion and in the name of Jesus Christ, not in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost because those are titles. They are not names. The name of all three is Jesus Christ. Acts 2.38, we read it already. Be baptized, every one of you. Not some of you. Not some that you, know, you want to show a physical representation. Not, not the ones where you're comfortable about it. But he said, every one, every one of you, Everybody with me? In the name of the Lord Jesus. And so when you are baptized, we say, I'm baptizing you in the name of Jesus. And when that name is applied to you, that, white, that black board of sin is washed away. The scent of sin is gone. Amen. Acts 10, 48. He gave orders for them to be... Oh, orders. Well, now we're talking about obedience. Oh, i gotta, I got to obey the word. He gave them orders for them to be baptized in the name of, oh, look at there, Jesus Christ. Acts 19 and 5, they, I'm just kind of reinforcing, they were all, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Several examples where they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Every believer, every believer, in the original church was baptized in the name of Jesus. The last but the not least is receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. To be born again, you must be filled with the Holy Ghost. I had a teacher in, in keyboarding class when I was growing up in high school, and she was a great lady. I loved her. Her name was Miss Howie. She was such a sweet lady. And uh, we, would be, we began to talk about the Holy Ghost, and I, I began to ask her, do you have the Holy Ghost? Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And she said, oh, well, my pastor does. I said, I was thinking, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Well, not yet. Oh, you, you need the Holy Ghost. Not Yeah, we need the Holy Ghost for salvation. We need the Holy Ghost to make it to heaven because it's the Holy Ghost that's going to quicken this mortal body. It is the Holy Ghost that when that trumpet is sound, the Holy Ghost is going to activate again. And this mortal body is going to change in the twinkling of an eye. Oh, and we're going to lead this world and we're going to meet them that are in the air and meet him in the air. So we need it for salvation. But I'm going to tell you what, putting salvation aside, which I love it, you want the Holy Ghost because that's when you receive power. Oh, we begin to worship like we worship. We begin to pray like we pray. And you feel the power of not filling any of our names. No, no. It's the power of the Holy Ghost. Yes. It's the power of the Holy Ghost. Faith, to be born again, you must be filled with the Holy Ghost, which is a separate experience from our belief experience. Faith and repentance will lead us to be filled with the Spirit of God. Every person that is filled with the Spirit will know because God gives them a sign. You'll know when you got the Holy Ghost. This isn't a guessing game. Do I have it? I don't know if I do or not. No. When I asked Miss Howie, do you have the Holy Ghost? Well, how do I know I have the Holy Ghost? God's going to give you a sign. Well, what's the sign? The sign he gives is a new unlearned language as the praise and the pray as we praise and pray unto God. His spirit will lead, it will guide, it will comfort, it will empower, and it will soon, very soon, it will take us to heaven. You will, when you receive the Holy Ghost, you will speak in another tongue. Something will come out of your mouth that you don't understand. It's a language that you don't know, and some of us probably, we probably none of us know it. But there will be an unknown tongue that will begin to come upon you. 
Now, now this may just be for the you know for for those that have been filled with the Holy Ghost for a long time. But there is a, a misconception that when somebody is new and they've never received the Holy Ghost, that they got to just be speaking in tongues. And sometimes they do. They go on for hours and hours and hours. But I've seen people receive the Holy Ghost where they speak in an unknown tongue for a short period of time. They too have received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We had over 120 receive the gift of the Holy Ghost in Bangladesh. Some of them were slain in the floor, but many of them, many of them spake in an unknown, unknown language uh, for a short period of time, and they too received the gift of the Holy Ghost. But in time, believe me, in time, as they get closer to God and the power of the Holy Ghost is activated, speaking in tongues will be like a second language. Actually, it'll probably be just like a first language. It'll just be like, man, I'm... I, I, whew. Sometimes you got to tell yourself, i got to speak in what the, what the words I do know first. That's what I have to tell myself, you know. But every person filled with the Holy Ghost will know because God will give you a sign. Okay, let's talk about that. And I'm almost finished because I've gone 32 minutes. John 3 and 3. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. We read that earlier. Okay, how do we born again? Except a man be born of water, that was baptism in Jesus' name, and of the Spirit, capital S, representing something supernatural. That is the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit used interchangeably. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He said being filled with the Spirit is part of being born again and saved. John 7 and 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Acts 5, 32, the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them, that obey Him. If you obey Him, you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because you've repented and you've been baptized in Jesus' name. Luke eleven thirteen. 13, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Jesus said the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost is for everyone to receive. If they believe, obey, which means we repent and we ask for it. We're asking God for it. Jesus said speaking in new tongues is a sign of a believer filled with the Holy Spirit. Where do we find this? Acts 2, 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. How do we know they were filled with the Holy Ghost? And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Why do these people talk in another language all of the time? Why do they speak in tongues? Because we've got the Holy Ghost. Amen. Acts 10, 45. I'm just reading portions of these scriptures. On the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How did they know that they had the Holy Ghost? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Amen. They magnify God. Acts 19 and 6. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them. Amen. When you come here to the altar, you repent of your sins. Someone will lay hands on your head. Someone will lay hands on you. And the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and they prophesied what, what, what prophesied whoa man now you got the Holy Ghost now you got the gifts of the spirit that's a whole nother lesson in the original church people who were filled with the Holy Spirit knew they were filled as God enabled them to pray and praise in a new language and God promised that's when we get to Acts 2 and 38 see church is more than just one verse we can't just use Acts 2.38 as a, as, a, as a, what's that phrase, as a cherry or, a, I don't know, like carrot. carrot, yeah. Just one scripture, Acts 2.38, bless God, I know that. But there's a lot of word that, that shows, that supports and backs Acts 2.38. I'm going to read it one more time as you stand tonight. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see, friend, after you have repented of your sins and you have been baptized, you've done all that God's asked you to do. And now God's going to give you the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is a gift from God, and it is for everyone. It is for everyone. It's for everyone, including you. It's for everyone, including me. It's for everyone, including your family. The Bible says... For as many that our God shall call. Now, I know this is different. I said it was going to be different. But I, I believe that this is for everybody under the sound of my voice tonight. 
There's some of you, you've spoken tongues a lot, but you haven't lately. I'm asking you to come in just a moment. There's some of us, we need a refreshing, we need a renewing. I'm asking you to come in just a moment. But I'm going to ask, as our eyes are closed tonight, our hearts are open to God, I'm going to ask you a question. Now that you have been presented with as simple as I can possibly give the Word of God to repent of your sins and to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, what will you do with it? Some of you have come and prayed and you've had tears, but you have not yet truly spake in another tongue. Some of you maybe have been here for years and you've never really spoke in tongues. As every eye is closed, I'm going to invite you to come to this altar right now. I'm going to invite you to come to this altar right now and to lift up your hands because I believe God is going to fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. He's going to fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. He's going to renew the Holy Ghost that was within you. Come on, people are coming. Faith is being lifted up toward heaven right now. Why don't you come? I'm telling you it's the best gift on this side of heaven. You want the Holy Ghost. You want the Holy Ghost. It's, it, it, oh, it, it, it's nothing to be afraid of. It's, some, it's a sweet gift. It's a precious gift. As you come, I want you to lift your hands right now. We're going to repent of our sins. Every eye closed, every heart open to God. Everybody just listen to me. Nobody's praying for anybody right now. I want every hand lifted. We're going to repent of our sins right now. Everybody. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. This is not the, say, the sinner's prayer. I'm just simply trying to help guide you because in a moment, we're going we're gonna to unleash you and you're going to talk to God your way. You know what you need to say. But I want you just to kind of say something like this. Lord, I love you. I'm asking for you to forgive me of all of my sin, all of my transgression. Forgive me any time I've said anything against you. Forgive me, oh God, for my thoughts. Forgive me, God, of my actions. Lord, forgive me of all things that I've done against you. Lord, I stand in need of the Holy Ghost. I stand in need of a refreshing of the Holy Ghost. Come on, you got to use your, you got to open your mouth. It doesn't have to be screaming or hollering, but you got to begin to speak. I want you just for a moment to begin to repent of your sins right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me of all of my sins. God, forgive me, Lord, of anything I've ever done, said, thought that was against you. That's it. Yes. I see you. You're using your mouth. You're using your words. The person next to you doesn't have to hear you. This is just between you and God. But you're using your tongue. You're using what the words that you are familiar with. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's it. Hallelujah. God, forgive me. God, cleanse me. God, purify me. God, wash me clean. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's it, man. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place because there is repentance in this atmosphere. God, I believe the angels of heaven are in the, I feel them walking in this place. Hallelujah. Because there's true repentance. There's true repentance. Hallelujah. 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 That's it. We're, we're just going to tarry here just for a moment. We're repenting of our sins. We're asking God to forgive us. Hallelujah, Lord. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now I want you to stop just for right now. I want, just listen to me. Nobody looking around. All of our eyes are closed. We're nobody looking around. I know it may be hard for you to receive this, but I have to tell you what you just did. God has now forgiven you of every one of your sins. If you truly, with godly sorrow, ask God to forgive you, it may be hard because you're thinking, oh, you don't even know what I've done. No, I don't. But you also don't know what I had done. You also don't know what the person next to you has done but I stand before you a man that has been forgiven by the mercy and by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Now we, we do have water. We do have a baptism already. If you want to be baptized in Jesus' name, this is how you do it. You come to myself, you come to Brother Caldwell, and you say, I want to be baptized in Jesus' name. 
But I've, I want to also tell you that if God so chooses to, He can fill you with the Holy Ghost. He can renew you in the Holy Ghost right now. Hallelujah. So in just a moment, we're going to lift our hands again, but I want you to begin praising God. I want you to begin magnifying God. And those of you who have not spoken tongues ever before, I believe God is going to fill you with the Holy Ghost. And you are going to begin speaking in an unknown tongue. You're going to begin to speak in an unknown tongue. You're going to have to lift up your voice. You're going to have to actually speak. You're going to have to talk. And you're going to have to yield your tongue to God. This is, God's not going to magically come upon you and take over. You're going to have to yield your heart to Him. You're going to have to, God's a gentleman. He's not going to come in here and sweep you off your feet. That's not how God is. But there are some of you that you have had the Holy Ghost before, and God is about to give you, He is about to hit you with the power of the Holy Ghost that you have never experienced before. Lift your hands right now, if you would. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lift your hands, and I want you to begin lifting your voice, and I want you to praise God with anything in any way that you know how to pray. Praise Him like a man or a woman has been forgiven, and that man and that woman is you. God has forgiven you. He has cleansed you. You have repented of your sins, and you are forgiven. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I want the ministry team to begin walking about. Don't lay on hand to any man suddenly, but I want you right now just to begin working with somebody. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Receive ye the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus Christ. Be renewed in the gift of the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. That's it, children. That's it, children. Just lift your voice. Lift your hands toward God. Be renewed. Be filled with the power and the gift of the Holy Ghost.